West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com We begin tonight with a rare warning about our democracy. It is in dire straits, and that is not according to just one or two, but rather 13 presidential libraries dating back to Herbert Hoover, all of which on Thursday released a joint statement calling for a a recommitment to the country's bedrock principles, including the rule of law and respecting a diversity of beliefs. Can't say this enough. This is an unprecedented move from the group. Never before have the presidential libraries engaged so directly in political affairs. And while the joint message stopped short of calling out individuals by name, the subject of the warning was clear. The declaration read, in part, Americans have a strong interest in supporting democratic movements and respect for human rights around the world because free societies elsewhere contribute to our own security and prosperity here at home. But that interest is undermined when others see our own house in disarray. Our elected officials must lead by example and govern effectively in ways that deliver for the American people. This, in turn, will help to restore trust in public service. Maybe you're thinking this sounds a bit melodramatic because things may not look like they're falling apart, but students of history will recall that one authoritarian method is too slowly to begin to chip away at democratic norms. It doesn't happen overnight. It's not gonna overhaul the whole system in one fell swoop, but if you keep chipping away at it, it will finally and ultimately erode. As Tom Nichols writes in The Atlantic, the collapse of democracy in the United States will look more like an unspooling or an unwinding rather than some dramatic installation, um, you know, of Gilead or Oceana. My guess is that it will be a federal breakdown that returns us to the late 1950s in all of the worst ways. Nichols admits he is guessing, but if informed, it might be an actually educated guess. Last month, a group of right-wing organizations and former Trump officials published something called Project 2025. It's essentially a roadmap for reshaping the federal government should the disgraced ex-president return to the White House. They want to gut the so-called administrative state from within by ousting federal employees that they believe are standing in the way of Trump's agenda and replacing them with like-minded officials more eager to fulfill their approach to governing. They believe on day one, they'll be able to commandeer, reshape, and do away with the, quote, deep state bureaucracy, in part by firing as many as 50,000 federal workers. And they have plans for the military as well. Former acting Secretary of Defense Christopher Miller contributed to this plan, and he wants Trump to immediately ban, quote, Marxist indoctrination and critical race theory programs and reinstate personnel dismissed for disobeying vaccine orders. As Nichols ends his essay, much of this stuff is nonsense, of course, but it'll be nonsense right up until the point it isn't. 
there are there these are all names that would reappear in a second Trump administration. We know that. And this time they'd move a lot faster in breaking down the federal guardrails around our democracy. And that should terrify all of us. Joining me now is Congressman and House Oversight Ranking Member uh, Jamie Raskin. Um, Congressman, it's great to have you back on the show. Thank you so much for making time for us this evening. What was your reaction to this unprecedented joint warning from the 13 presidential libraries? Well, I'm glad that people who are concerned about American history are willing to intervene in the moment to say that um, the Trump movement is threatening to uh, utterly derange and deform the American experiment. And that's where we are. We're still in the thick of this struggle. And so it's good to have people speaking out about that. Um, you know, they are laying out their plans to renew what Steve Bannon talked about uh, at the very beginning of the Trump administration, which was to dismantle the deep state, by which he means the federal government that implements uh, the laws of the people adopted by Congress. So if they can't repeal the Clean Air Act, if they can't repeal the Social Security Act, if they can't repeal the Clean Water Act or the Fair Labor Standards Act, they will make it impossible for the federal government to enforce any of these critical framework statutes. And Congressman, let me get your thoughts on this plan, this so-called Project 2025 put forth by Trump allies. It sounds almost super villain-esque. Um, why are they so desperate to gut the federal government? And how seriously should we take this? Well, very seriously. I mean, we see the way that they targeted women's right to choose in Roe versus Wade. They packed the courts with uh, Federalist Society right wingers and they demolished Roe versus Wade and they've thrown the country into an uproar over this assault on women's rights. Um, they've rolled the clock back on the civil rights progress that we've made uh, since the 1960s and 70s in many different ways. I mean, you've got Governor DeSantis who's trying to teach children that slavery was basically a skills training apprenticeship program um, in you know the beginning of American history. Um, and so what they're really talking about doing is demolishing and destroying uh, the New Deal and repealing uh, the administrative state that's used to enforce statutes like the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the National Labor Relations Act. They want to make it impossible for federal laws to be implemented. Now, it's the president's job to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. That's the heart of his constitutional duty. But they, of course, you know, want to take care that all of the laws be totally frustrated and defeated. Um, and that's their vision. They want to return power to corrupt right wing uh, state governments and make the federal government just for military and national security state purposes and for, you know, passing out corporate uh, largesse to their best friends in business. Congressman, let me uh, pivot for a moment and get your thoughts, if I can, on the developments out of Georgia with Mark Meadows failing to move his Georgia election case to a federal court. I mean, as somebody who has investigated January 6th so closely as a result of the second impeachment trial, what do you make of, uh, of that development and the argument that Mark Meadows was trying to make that he was simply doing his job as the White House chief of staff? Well, the critical issue in that ruling, Eamon, was whether or not he was uh, fulfilling uh, his federal duties. And if he had been fulfilling his federal uh, work assignment, then he really could have gotten his case removed to federal court. Those are statutes that are there to protect you know, federal workers who are trying to implement civil rights laws, for example, against recalcitrant racist governments in the South. But uh, the court, I think, rendered an excellent ruling saying if you're getting involved in politics generally as a federal worker, you're violating the Hatch Act. You've crossed the line to engaging in political work. And if you go all the way through just getting involved in a campaign to trying to overthrow an election, you're not just being uh, involved unlawfully 
in campaigning, you're involved in a criminal assault against the constitutional order. None of those things can be protected by federal law, and none of them give you the refuge of the federal courts from a prosecution uh, in state court for your crimes. And of course, sir, you know, our viewers know you very well as a congressman, but you are a constitutional law professor for many years. Let me get your thoughts on this effort to use the 14th Amendment to bar Trump from the 2024 ballot. Do you think it is a worthy legal strategy to pursue or is it doomed to fail? No, the, the January 6th Select Committee invoked it and we talked about it also during the impeachment. It's gotten a new lease on life as an argument because two very conservative Federalist Society professors wrote this law review article for the UPenn Law Review. But Section 3 of the 14th Amendment says that anyone who's sworn an oath to uphold the Constitution who violates the oath by, quote, engaging in insurrection or rebellion shall never be allowed to hold federal or state office again. Those professors made the point that this is a self-executing provision, like the one saying you've got to be 35 years old to run for president. If you show up to get on the ballot in Colorado and you're 22 years old, the Board of Elections or the Secretary of State will just say you're not qualified. And they're making the point that these administrative actors can also say you're not qualified to someone who is engaged in insurrection against the union. So I think this is an issue that's going to break out all over the country and inevitably it will make its way up to the Supreme Court of the United States. The Section 3 of the 40th Amendment doesn't say you can't have been, you can't run for office if you've been convicted of insurrection or rebellion. It just says you can't have engaged in insurrection or rebellion, which implies that it can be determined as a civil matter and you don't need to go to criminal court. Of course, Congress already determined in the impeachment that President Trump had incited insurrection against the union and there was a 57 to 43 vote to convict him of that on the Senate side. Not enough to get to the two thirds of holding him culpable, but still robust bipartisan majorities in both houses saying that he had in fact engaged in insurrection by inciting it. Uh, Congressman, we spend a lot of time on this show talking about your oversight colleague, James Comer, and his conspiracy laden quest to try and connect Joe Biden to his son's uh, foreign business dealings. Now you have House Republicans pushing for an impeachment inquiry into the president without any factual basis to do so. Do Republicans at this point even care about policy and getting things done for Americans? I mean, if this is what the base of their party wants, how do Democrats work to counter-program all this nonsense? Well, when um, the Trump movement took over the Republican Party, they didn't pass a platform. Uh, and that was a, a fairly explicit statement that their platform is just whatever Donald Trump tells them it is. It's not a party that's unified by any programmatic or policy purposes. It's unified simply by their subservience to Donald Trump and their willingness to do whatever he tells them to do. So, um, yeah, I, I think that, that what's definitive of the GOP today, alas, Lincoln's party, is that it's become a cult of authoritarian personality. Um, they are going to impeachment simply because Donald Trump feels like he doesn't uh, want to run against someone who's not been impeached when he's the first twice impeached president in U.S. history. I keep reminding my Republican colleagues that the constitutional standard for impeachment is treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors, and they haven't laid any wrongdoing at the footsteps of Joe Biden. They've got nothing on him. Uh, they've got 91 criminal charges against Donald Trump in courts all over the land. And there's nothing against Joe Biden and Trump can't live with that. So that's why they're saying they're not going to vote for a budget. They'll shut the government down unless there are impeachment proceedings initiated against Joe Biden. And speaking of oversight, I got to ask you um, about uh, Jared Kushner. I mean, you have asked Comer to subpoena Jared Kushner's investment firm over its ties to the Saudi uh, Arabian government, to the Qatari government, United Arab Emirates as well. Can you explain why you are concerned? What have you seen that that makes you worried? Uh, about this that want you want to have subpoenaed. Jared Kushner created a company the day after the Trump administration ended uh, and proceeded to collect billions of dollars, more than $2 billion from the Saudi government uh, for investment there, despite the fact that the sovereign investment funds um, investment advisors recommended against it. They were overruled. 
approached by the homicidal crown prince himself, Mohammed bin Salman, who said he wanted to give that money to Jared Kushner in addition to a $25 million a year management fee. Um, there's been very little of that money invested. The whole thing smells like a huge payback, uh, a payoff essentially for everything that Kushner did for uh, Mohammed bin Salman in the Saudis when he was running Middle East foreign policy there. And remember, he covered up for uh, bin Salman's uh, brutal dismemberment and assassination of Jamal Khashoggi, uh, his drawing and quarter, quartering. Um, he tilted towards Saudi Arabia in the Yemen war when there were just terrible atrocities taking place against uh, the Yemen population. Um, and in fact, the Kushner had pushed for Saudi Arabia to be the first destination of Donald Trump in his foreign travel. So he got this huge payback. Uh, we've been trying to get documents showing what exactly they were doing for each other, but Jared Kushner refuses to comply. He's not answering any of the Democrats' requests. And Chairman Comer, he said he agrees with us that Kushner crossed the line, crossed a line of ethics, ethics. And if that's true, then he should go ahead and render a subpoena so Kushner will comply with our request so we can get to the bottom of this massive conflict of interest, likely foreign emoluments clause uh, violation and crime against the public interest. And uh, our foreign policy has been um, you know, irrevocably damaged by what Jared Kushner did uh, with Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf monarchies. And we want to get to the bottom of it. It is Monday, the 11th of September of 2023, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. Precious, the little Yorkie, is our door girl, and she will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special River City Hash Mondays. Uh, yeah, well, it's 9-11, 22 years after the fact, and uh, looks like the Republican Party is out there telling us to never forget. I will never forget a lot. <laughs> a lot of what we seem to have forgotten. Uh, I, I pretty much remember how the country came together on uh, 9-11. Uh, liberals and conservatives, young and old, we all came together. It's sort of like that uh, that uh, scene in, in Independence Day when the uh, spaceships are making their way across the skyline of, say, like New York, for instance. And uh, all these people sort of, like, line up, and, you know, they're very diverse uh, in terms of age and, and ethnicity and national origins and etc. cetera. And uh, by September 13th, <laughs> that was all forgotten, all of it. We came together, and by the 13th, eh, yeah. And I have to say, it was uh, brought about by one G.W. Bush when uh, the dissembling immediately began and the lies and how we felt it. We knew it. <laughs> we, we knew they were lies. Okay, well, here we are. Now we've got this uh, MAGA party. I like to call them MAGA Nazis. Who are out there, you know, just lighting up social media. Never forget. Never forget. Yeah, I, I kind of remember how every single one of these MAGA Nazis has voted against funding bills for, uh, to, to, uh, to fund, uh, Health care for first responders suffering cancer from asbestos. You know, being at ground zero. They have voted against funding every single bill, but never forget 9-11. We won't forget. I remember Pat Tillman giving up a pro football career right after 9-11 joining the military, becoming an army ranger, 
getting sent to Afghanistan and then getting fragged when he made it known that uh, he figured out that Bush had lied. What was his last words? Stop shooting. I'm fucking Pat Tillman. He said, oh, good. We're, we're hitting our mark then. Anybody was uncertain, they said, yeah, that's, that's where Tillman is. Get him. And then we have uh, people like Carrie Lake out there saying, Pat Tillman made the ultimate sacrifice. Yeah, he got fragged by you fuckers. Give me an effing break. I remember that we attacked a country that had nothing to do with 9-11. It was the equivalent, as we said back in the day, as if after Pearl Harbor, instead of Japan, we decided to bomb Mexico. Well, at least we got to bomb something. And that's how Cheney and Bush Co. figured it would work, and it worked. Bomb somewhere, and the American people will say, we're doing something. We're fighting terrorism. I remember when we first had to take off our shoes because of shoe bombers. I remember that very well. And what's uh, what's interesting is that to this day, we still have to take off our shoes. And yet, Anybody, and when I say anybody, I'm saying anybody, even an eight-year-old in some states, can get a military-grade assault weapon and bring it to any bank, casino, church, theater, workplace, retail store, public event, supermarket, school, a campus, a synagogue, or any apartment building. Never forget. Never. And we won't. All right. I could go on, but uh, that was quite a long clip at the top there, and I thought it was important that we uh, we get it out there because uh, uh, we're in the fight for our lives. This gaslighting has been going on for a long time, more than 22 years, but we might as well just start thinking about 22 years ago and what happened and where we are today. It wasn't hippie punks who brought us here. Let's be clear about that, though Antifa and Black Lives Matter will be blamed for everything. Sort of like, instead of Japan... We bomb Mexico. In fact, that's exactly what they want to do now is bomb Mexico. Come full circle. The jokes are no longer jokes. It is now foreign policy or domestic, too. All right. What do we have in store for you here on this? Well, I think all 9-11 should have a certain solemnness to it, shouldn't it? Maybe. Well, on the rest of the menu, DeSantis's immigration law is worsening labor shortages in Florida just as the planting season begins. An obscure Trump lawyer stands out as a key witness in the election tampering cases. And a Minnesota meat processing plant that is accused of hiring child laborers agreed to pay 300,000 bucks in penalties. After the break, we move to the chef's table where a foreign student has been arrested in Norway on suspicion of espionage, including illegal eavesdropping. And if you think inflation is bad now, and we're hearing from everybody on the MAGA side that inflation is through the roof and when it's actually been going down, if you think that inflation in America is high, Egypt's annual inflation rate hit a new record high of 39.7% in August. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
usuals and get right into this first offering here at the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And it is brought to us by staff at the Miami Herald. A new state immigration law could worsen labor shortages in South Florida's agricultural industry, a sector that heavily relies on migrant labor and struggles to find domestic workers, according to growers, immigrant workers, and farm worker advocates. Maria Vasquez, a Mexican nursery worker in Homestead, said that over the last year, she has witnessed colleagues and community members leave South Miami-Dade County, a region that grows warm weather plants, fruits, and vegetables that don't grow in most of the rest of the country. Many people here risk their lives crossing the desert to get to this country. They leave children, wives. Then they come to a state where they put this law in place. They get scared and leave for another where they won't get persecuted, said Vasquez, who has lived in Homestead for over two decades. The new Florida law, known as SB 1718, came into effect on July 1st. The legislation cracks down on undocumented labor and enacts a series of other immigration-related restrictions. Like if you know an immigrant, go to jail. The extent of the law's impact will become clearer as agricultural businesses need more hands to harvest winter and spring produce as seasonal workers return to harvest the fruits and vegetables, say farmers, workers, and advocates. They told the Miami Herald... The law could cause Florida agricultural businesses to bring more temporary foreign workers through a federal government program for agriculture called H-2A. Florida already has the highest concentration of H-2A positions at 14% in the last government fiscal year, according to the Department of Agriculture. The program is designed to alleviate worker shortages faced by farms across the U.S., but the visas are costly to sponsor, and advocates say the program is ripe for the exploitation and forced labor of the participating workers who heavily depend on their U.S.-based employers. Bang of MSNBC brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. The Georgia Special Grand Jury Report is broken down into sections. Each Roman numeral is a section that addresses what the special grand jurors thought was a crime in violation of the Georgia statute and who they believe committed these crimes. Each section states the relevant statutes and discusses the votes. That is important. This is what you call complete transparency within this judicial system. We don't know the names of the special grand jurors. Those will remain confidential and for good reason, and you know why. Okay, but you will see, for example, with regards to that January 2nd, 2021 phone call from Trump to Secretary of State Raffensperger, the grand jury recommends the district attorney seek an indictment against the following individuals. And the relevant statutes are then listed. You can see 21 yay votes and one nay vote, zero abstentions, depending on which of the statutes. This shows there were people who disagreed with whether or not these persons necessarily committed crimes. I should note here that the one nay vote was one person throughout all of the uh, procedure. Uh, 27, 28 jurors, and this one consistently voted no and... That could be an issue. 
But we'll get back to this article. The pages that really stand out, though, are pages 6, 7, and 8, which talk about the national effort to overturn the 2020 election results in specific states. And that's where you see incredibly noteworthy names like Graham of South Carolina, former Senators Purdue and Loeffler of Georgia. You also see some very prominent Trump legal world names like Cleta Mitchell, Lynn Wood, and Boris Epstein. But... There are people who are either still in the legal orbit or they've since exited, uh, which happens often with Trump lawyers, and that's the people that we just mentioned. But there are two other people worth noting on page seven, Kurt Hilbert and Alex Kaufman, the Georgia lawyers who actually helped Trump and the Trump campaign litigate in the state of Georgia to try to, in the courtroom, overturn the results of the 2020 election. And I will jump in once again here just to make note and to remind folks that once these starts of these types of procedures happen in a coup, it is then an insurgency. Back to the article. Now, Katie Fang says she saw Hilbert come and testify under oath in an evidentiary hearing two weeks ago in federal court, former Trump White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows in his attempt to remove his Georgia state prosecution to federal court. And he had an evidentiary hearing in front of a federal judge and the state of Georgia called Hilbert to testify. So think about this for a second. You've got a special grand jury that's recommending somebody like Hilbert who helped Trump be indicted under Georgia's racketeering statute. But then the state used him as a witness. We know there are 150 witnesses on behalf of Fulton County DA, Fonnie Willis. We heard that in court two days ago. Of those 150 witnesses, we see at least one person in the special grand jury report, Hilbert. So it's going to be interesting to see. Is Lindsey Graham going to be called to testify by the state of Georgia against Donald Trump if this goes to trial? That is a question that remains unanswered. here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A meat processing company in Minnesota agreed to pay $300,000 in penalties after an investigation found it employed children as young as 13 to work in hazardous conditions, such as operating meat grinders while they worked overnight shifts and longer hours than allowed by law. Tony Downs Food Company, based in Mankato, also agreed to obey child labor laws and hire a compliance specialist as part of a consent order with the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry. The agency says the meat processing company employed at least eight children, ranging from ages 13 to 17 at its plant in Medellia. Investigators also have identified other employees who were hired before they were 18 years old. The young employees, one of whom was 13 years old when hired, operated meat grinders, ovens, and forklifts on overnight shifts, and also worked in areas where meat products are flash frozen with carbon monoxide and ammonia. They also worked longer hours than permitted by law, and some were injured. 
think three hundred thousand dollars is a slap on the wrist. Okay, let us now go to our break, and when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You were listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, Fight Like a Girl. Bottoms is a fresh take on a trope used in many a teenage comedy tale, where the main characters set out to try and lose their virginity. However, in this case, the protagonists are two high school girls who are, in their own words, ugly, unpopular gays. Starring Io Debery as Josie and Rachel Sinat as PJ, the latter decides that the best way to accomplish their goal is to start a female self-defense or fight club. PJ believes that doing so might lure two of the school's most popular girls, cheerleaders Rose and Brittany, who happen to be their respective objects of desire. After some cajoling, Josie reluctantly agrees to the plan, and along the way, the pair become a trio when Hazel, played by Ruby Cruz, eagerly joins in the hopes that the club will serve to empower girls and create a sort of sisterhood. Much to Josie and PJ's surprise, the idea actually starts to take off. However, questions remain as to whether it will last. The film has a deliberate late 90s, early aughts throwback vibe to it. There are no smartphones, but unlike many of the teen raunch comedies it's modeled on, Bottoms makes it pretty clear that this one is satire, and not to be taken too seriously. Adibere and Sanat, who also happens to be the movie's co-writer, have wonderful chemistry, which may have something to do with the fact that the pair have been friends and colleagues in comedy since they were both undergrads at NYU, including a recent gig on Comedy Central. Like a gayer, more violent, mean girls, Bottoms may not achieve greatness, but it does feature some laugh-out-loud moments as well as several memorable performances and as such deserves a place on your watch list. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. Hi, Science Quickly listeners. This is Jeff Delvisio, executive producer of the show. The whole podcast team is out in the field, so while we're away, we're bringing back a few amazing oldies from the archive. Today, we dive into your brain during bouts of intense learning. Maybe that happens to you when you listen to this podcast. Producer Karen Hopkins brings us a study that looked at brain training and how rest might be the key to training your brain even faster. The episode first aired on July 21st, 2021, when we were still called 60 Second Science. Ah, uh, memories. Enjoy. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Karen Hopkin. They say that practice makes perfect. But sometimes, the best practice is not on a keyboard. It's all in your head. Because a new study shows that the brain takes advantage of the rest periods during practice to review new skills, a mechanism that facilitates learning. The work appears in the journal Cell Reports. A lot of the skills we learn in life are sequences of individual actions. Leonardo Cohen of the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, or NINDS. For example, playing a piece of piano music requires pressing individual keys in the correct sequence with very precise timing. That level of virtuosity requires a ton of practice and a lot of repetition. But Cohen says it also requires a certain amount of rest. We know from previous research that interspersing rest with practice during training is advantageous for learning a new skill. In fact, 
we recently showed that virtually all early skill learning is evidence during rest rather than during the actual practice. It's during those intermittent breaks that the brain starts to sew together the individual movements that make up a seamless piece. And the question then becomes, how? To find out, Cohen and his colleagues turned to an imaging technique called magnetoencephalography, or MEG. The unique advantage of MEG is that it allows us to observe neural activity across the entire brain with millisecond time resolution, which is crucial for investigating very fast, widespread brain dynamics. Ethan Bush, Cohen's colleague at NINDS. They and their team had 30 volunteers sit inside an MEG scanner, and they asked them to type the sequence 41324 on a keyboard as quickly and accurately as possible. The participants would type for 10 seconds, rest for 10 seconds, and then repeat, while the researchers monitored their neural activity. And what we found was really quite interesting. So we actually found that the brain kept replaying much faster versions of the practice activity patterns over and over again during rest. So a sequence that might take one second for fingers to type would take just 50 milliseconds for the brain to replay. So that's an impressive 20-fold compression. The regions most active were those involved in controlling movement and representing sequences. And the more often the brain repeated the sequence, the faster the subject improved. When the participants were beginning to learn the skill, they were initially typing about five to six repetitions of the sequence during each 10 seconds of practice. But during rest, the brain replayed about 25 repetitions of the sequence, and that's a five-fold increase over the same amount of time. That lightning-quick neural rehearsal supercharges learning and memory. It's as if the brain actively exploits these rest periods to amplify the effects of practice and rapidly consolidate the skill memory. And this actually appears to be the skill binding mechanism that we were looking for. So next time you sit down to practice, give yourself a break. Or a lot of little breaks. Your brain and your audience will thank you. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. For older adults, optimal aging includes preventing injuries, effectively managing existing chronic conditions, and maintaining physical and cognitive health and social engagement. I'm Dr. Linda Anderson, Director of CDC's Healthy Aging Program. The promotion of cognitive health is a critical component of overall good health. Cognitive health among older adults is not just the absence of disease. It's the development and preservation of cognitive abilities such as memory, language, judgment, and remembered skills such as driving. Cognitive abilities enable individuals to maintain social connectedness, an ongoing sense of purpose, and the ability to function independently. In 2013, CDC and the Alzheimer's Association released the second in a series of roadmaps. This roadmap, the Public Health Roadmap for State and National Partnerships 2013 to 2018, was developed as part of CDC's Healthy Brain Initiative. It reflects the insights and expertise of a wide range of stakeholders at the national, state, and community levels. The roadmap shares the Healthy Brain Initiative's vision of cognitive health as a vital component of overall health and well-being, an area ripe for public health efforts. Specific actions are addressed in four traditional domains of public health. The first is monitor and evaluate. Tracking the health of the nation is a fundamental public health function. Actions in this area include assessments related to cognitive health that help quantify and qualify the public health impact and inform public health policies and strategies. 
The second domain is Educate and Empower the Nation, which focuses on actions that raise public awareness and improve access to information and resources. The third domain, Develop Policy and Mobilize Partnerships, includes actions aimed at ensuring that cognitive health is integrated into a broad spectrum of public health work. The fourth area, Assure a Competent Workforce, focuses on preparing public health professionals to translate current and emerging findings on cognitive health into effective public health practice. This roadmap provides a solid foundation for the public health community to anticipate and respond as new scientific discoveries related to cognitive health emerge. Public health agencies and partners are encouraged to work together on actions that best fit their mission, needs, interests, and capabilities. For more information, please visit cdc.gov slash aging slash healthy brain. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetrootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetrootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping Progressive Radio at full power. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Donna Phillips. Today we introduce our series on political parties, as part of our Civil Discourse and American Legacy project. We are joined by special guest, Dr. Lester Brooks, American History Professor Emeritus from Anne Arundel Community College. Welcome, Dr. Brooks. Thank you for having me. Sure thing. Dr. Brooks, what are the functions of political parties? There are a number of political uh, party functions, uh, one being ideology, uh, meaning that each political party has a platform, that is, uh, their beliefs, uh, what they believe in. And they offer their platform, their beliefs to the public, and we, the citizen, have options. uh, Which of those belief systems uh, are comfortable for us? Uh, uh, Another function is monitoring. They monitor each other. They keep a close eye on each other. Uh, They also... uh, provide us with candidates, Uh, they engage in electioneering, uh, and they also serve as a uniting force because they exist in all the 50 states. So there are these crucial functions that political uh, parties provide for us uh, that uh, uh, we can see from the beginning of the country up till today. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. That is all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. Today in Labor History, we pause to remember the events that took place on the morning of September 11th. The year was 2001. Terrorists hijacked planes and intentionally crashed them into the Twin Towers in New York City and the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. Nearly 3,000 people were killed in the attack, including 634 union members. They were members of the fire and police unions that had responded to help those at the scene of the attack. They were also pilots and flight attendants on the crashed planes. 343 firefighters died on that day. It was the deadliest firefighter disaster in U.S. history. Before September 11th, the greatest loss of firefighters in an urban building collapse fire occurred in Chicago in 1910. 21 firefighters were killed while fighting a fire in the stockyards. 11 years after the September 11th attack, Harold Schattenberger of the International Association of Firefighters recalled their sacrifice. At the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, our members gave everything they had. 
the best that this union and this nation have to offer was demonstrated in their courageous response. In the aftermath of September 11th, the Firefighters Union worked to improve benefits and protections for their members and their families. In particular, the Uniformed Firefighters Association Local 94 and Uniformed Fire Officers Association Local 854 lobbied Washington officials on these issues. In 2010, President Barack Obama signed the James Zagroda 9-11 Health and Compensation Act into law. The act was named after a police officer who developed a fatal respiratory disease while working at recovery efforts at Ground Zero. The act provided medical monitoring and treatment to World Trade Center responders. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 53 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs in the mid-80s, a mix of cloud and sun throughout the day, winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour, a few passing clouds overnight with lows in the mid-50s, winds out of the west-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour, then cloudy early tomorrow, becoming mostly sunny in the afternoon with highs around the mid-80s, winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Ragweed pollen is rated as moderate here in the little village of Rogue River. The air quality index for the region is in the moderate range at 69 parts per million. And that daytime UV index is in the high range at level 6, so you still need to take care. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.09 inches. Visibility is at is up to 10 miles, and relative humidity is at 81%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world, and that is the weather underground. London is 76 degrees and partly cloudy. Paris is 84 and sunny with a heat advisory. Rome is 85 and sunny. Kabul is 71 and clear. Kiev is 71 and mostly cloudy. Hong Kong is 80 degrees and mostly cloudy. Tokyo is 80 and partly cloudy. Melbourne, Victoria, Australia is 54 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 61 and fair. Chicago, Illinois is 66 with showers in the vicinity, bringing with it over a half an inch of rain today. And New York, New York is 80 degrees and mostly cloudy with a flood watch. So take care. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. A 25-year-old foreign student has been arrested in Norway on suspicion of espionage, including illegal eavesdropping through 
various technical devices. Norway's domestic security agency told Norwegian media that the man who was arrested on Friday was charged in court yesterday Sunday with espionage and intelligence operations against the Nordic country. The man, whose identity and nationality have not been disclosed, has pleaded not guilty in initial police questioning. Norwegian authorities have not said which country the man was allegedly spying for. Police have seized from the man a number of data-carrying electronic devices, which the security agency is now investigating. The suspect is a student, but is not enrolled at an educational institution in Norway and has been living in Norway for a relatively short period of time. Citing the arrest order, the suspect had allegedly been caught conducting illegal signal surveillance in a rental car near the Norwegian Prime Minister's office and the Defense Ministry. According to a court decision, the man has been imprisoned in pretrial custody for four weeks with a ban on receiving letters and visits. Security officials said the suspect was not operating alone. In its previous assessments, the Norwegian security agency has singled out neighboring Russia, China, and North Korea as state actors that pose a significant intelligence threat to Norway, a nation of 5.4 million people, and I might add, a threat to the world as a whole. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Even more staff at the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Egypt's annual inflation rate hit a new record high in August as the cash-strapped country continues to battle price hikes and a depreciating currency. Uh, The annual inflation rate reached, get this, 39.7% 39.7% last month, up from 382 that was recorded in July, according to data released by the state-run Central Agency for Mobilization and Statistics. On a monthly basis, prices grew 1.6% last month, down from a prior 1.9% rise in July. I should note, the inflation rate in the United States for August was 3.2%. And apparently that's deathly high for MAGA Republicans. Prices in Egypt rose rose across many sectors from food items and medical services to housing and furniture following the Russia-Ukraine war, which unleashed a wave of inflation across the globe. It wasn't Joe. The figures released yesterday morning Sunday show that food prices, the main drivers of inflation, rose by over 70% in August compared to the same month last year. Grains, meat, poultry, fish, and fruit were among the products with the biggest price spikes. The inflation rate in August more than doubled compared to the same month last year, when it recorded 15.3% of inflation. The surge is compounded by economic pressures, shortage of foreign currency, and successive devaluation of the local currency. The Egyptian pound lost more than 50% of its value against the dollar since the Russian war on Ukraine broke out in February of 2022. This has added further burdens on millions of Egyptians who found their savings running low as the cost of living surged. 
About 30% of Egyptians are poor, according to official figures. Egypt, the most populous Arab country with over 105 million people, is the world's largest wheat importer. Most of its imports traditionally come from Ukraine and Russia. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Ton mange à d'un d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Ton mange à d'un d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver